Well, thank you all for coming. We've got a good crowd here. That's super. We still must have some star power. Um, thanks for that presentation, Mr. Tasse. Very interesting. Uh, what we're going to explore on this panel with three practitioners of the corporate art, if I can put it that way, um, all of the, uh, the various aspects of corporate ownership structures. Um, just as an overview, Canada allows dual class shares on its exchanges, but some countries do not. Some exchanges do not. The Council of Inter Institutional Investors and others opposes it for two reasons. Shareholder democracy, one vote, one shareholder, and concerns about governance and accountability because people with multiple share voting can outvote uh, other, other shareholders uh, to, to suit their needs. Not that this happens very often. So to discuss these and other issues, uh, our panel is uh, quite esteemed. And I have one declaration of conflict. My husband is John Beck. Okay, so he's going to get the softball questions. For sure. I have a conflict too, not just her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our uh, first uh, right to my left is Michael McCain, known to every Canadian, chairman of Maple Leaf Foods, one of Canada's most successful multinational corporations. It's controlled by the McCain family with 40% of the stock, okay? No voting, non-voting shares, no dual shares, multiple shares, uh, vote, votes, I mean. Uh, then there's John Beck, uh, founder and chairman of the Acon Group Limited, Canada's largest construction company, which grew from a small family business started by John's parents and is now a widely held corporation. And then we have Louis O'Day, executive chair of Kojigo Inc. and Kojigo Communications, a successful telecommunications and media company in Canada and the United States. It is controlled through multiple voting shares by the O'Day family. So we have three representatives of different kinds of structures of family. So I think that we're gonna have a terrific um, uh, discussion. Now I'm gonna, in order of seating, they're gonna each talk for four or five minutes from their viewpoint about the, about the uh, presentation, but also about all these various issues surrounding ownership. And then I will talk, maybe ask them some supplementals and hopefully we'll have a discussion and they can feel free to debate a little bit within, within the panel. And so Michael, to you. Well, thank you, Diane. It's wonderful to be here and uh, a subject that is uh, so, I think, certainly so important to us as a, as a business family that uh, has, has uh, existed through multiple generations. Um, I think uh, in a very short period of time, I would say in reaction to your remarks, the, the theme here today in the presentation, that I think is really important to uh, dissect this into two different issues because there are, there are two, different, uh, two different threads here that are uh, super important. The first is the first thread is you know the value the uh, the value uh, the merits and demerits of a controlled enterprise, um, and the second is the role of dual class shares en route or as a means to an end to accomplish a controlled en enterprise, and I think those are you know, very different uh, very different topics. Um, we have in uh, in my enterprise we have a forty percent. Um, uh, of the votes, um, and I will declare myself, I'm philosophically opposed to the use of dual class shares and have been all my life. Um, and I believe in the democratic principle of one share, one vote. And that's been, you know, kind of realized through the, uh, the uh, business that uh, my family uh, leads. We do take a controlling position in that family or in that business. Uh, we describe ourselves as owner operators. Uh, that is in not, you know, we don't have our, we're, we've got our hands on the wheel, uh, so to speak. Uh, but I believe in, the, in the, the efficacy of the merits of a controlled enterprise for three basic reasons. The first is horizon. Uh, the second is, um, is a, you know, care and interest in the community. Uh, and, and the third is a multi-stakeholder view. Uh, in terms of horizon, you know, I think short-termism is one of the curses in society, not just in business, uh, but in, in the corporation, in the capital markets, in politics, even in consumerism today. And I think that, uh, that a controlled enterprise can, uh, can, can um, overcome that. 
uh, with respect to multi-stakeholderism. I think there's a, a greater propensity of a controlled enterprise to have a multi-stakeholder view, notwithstanding the paradox of family control. And I also feel like the, the values of the family tend to permeate through the business, which makes it a little bit more caring as an organization. And all three of those things over a period of time, I believe deliver a better outcome. Uh, dual class shares is a means to an end. Um, uh, I think it's a little bit, it, you know, it gets very emotional and very philosophical. I have a philosophical bias against it. Uh, it's a little bit like talking about the, the merits or demerits of a benevolent dictatorship. Governance, you know, governance is, uh, I don't think governance makes stakeholders a nickel. I don't think it makes anybody any money. What it does is prevent abuse. And in the process of preventing abuse, the problem isn't dual class shareholders. The problem is the abuses that it might uh, entertain much like a benevolent dictatorship that slips into something that's a little bit less benevolent. And uh, I think that's where the concern is, and that's why I have the philosophical bias against it. Thank you, Michael. Have you ever thought of the dual share yeah, structure? Sure. For sure, yeah, we did. We looked at it. Um, I mean, it's not something you can go back and forth easily, but um, when we bought into uh, Maple Leaf Foods in 1995, it was a consideration, and we said that's not what we want to do. John? And I think there's other means to an end. You can get to you can get to a controlled enterprise without that. Is where where our perspective was. Thank you, John. Yeah. So I'm the I'm the angel here. I'm the purest one because <laughs> <laughs> because we run a complete democracy. And so we one vote uh, per shareholder, no matter what. Uh, there is no control block. In fact, uh, I think the biggest shareholder is 5 or 6% of our company, so it's very widely held. And we believe that that mechanism assures the best outcome for the owners of the corporation that are their shareholders, all the owners. And the way that works is we have independent directors, 8 out of 10 are independent, selected by votes of the shareholders, they um, send a message, a societal message, if you wish, uh, to the board for the right uh, protection of their interests and for their wishes um, for proper E, S, and G, best-in-class practices, and they want to make sure that that takes, takes place. And so on our board, we have a variety of independent thinkers who talk about the E, who talk about the S, who talk about the G, and who keep management uh, accountable for all of that. The biggest, most important job of a board is to hire and fire the CEO. That process should be a completely independent and pure process, rather than one which may be influenced by certain power blocks within within the organizations. Uh, I believe we've been public for over 50 years, and we've had many, many events, and I'll talk about that a little later, about times where the shareholder vote was the most important factor in the decision and how the company moved forward. I've run, I've been, I was CEO and now I'm chairman of the company, long ago gave up control through acquisitions, through mergers and growth for the company in the benefit and the interest of the shareholders. But I continue to influence the board through moral authority, not the number of votes I have, but the credibility and the history and the culture of the company of which I'm fiercely protected. Interesting. Great. Thank you. Louis? So, uh, good morning, everyone. So first off, I would like to congratulate my co-panelists for having managed to maintain control of their company without dual-class shares. I think that is a remarkable achievement. Um, I know that if we didn't have multiple voting shares, having become a public company in 1985, we would have disappeared 10 times. So uh, you, you can understand why we think it's important. 
Um, what we have heard this morning is a scientific paper, of which you can get a full copy. And what it does, it examines scientifically what are the returns, what are the impacts on the environment, what are the impacts on society, and they conclude that the governance that is behind these numbers make these numbers possible. And, and that's why this question about governance is, in my opinion, seriously in doubt. Now, what are the ingredients? And I think John uh, and Michael have alluded to them. The ingredients are you need a strong board of directors made up of independent directors for the most part. In our situation, they're all independent except two, the CEO, who's employed by the company, and myself, employed uh, family representative, which we choose very carefully for their expertise. And they discharge their responsibility to shareholders in a very professional manner. Um, and so, and we now have a CEO that is not family related, and that is a normal evolution. I think families more and more become more custodians of the, um, of the culture of the company, of its general orientation, um, of what we wish to get involved in and what we will never get involved in, because that's very important. Now, um, I would like to, with respect, uh, correct a few things here. All the major stock exchanges in the world allow multiple voting shares. Brazil, Mexico, United States, Canada, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Italy, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, New Zealand, and the only two major stock exchanges that are holdouts are France and Germany. So, and France and Germany are actively considering uh, agreeing to uh, the month of the voting share structure. Now, why would they do that? They do that because they understand that if they don't, entrepreneurs will not register their companies on public stock exchanges. They'll do something else. Now, whatever they do, I don't know. And when you make a decision like that, you somewhat limit your financing options. That's why we became public. But it, it is a sufficiently high pressure for them to have decided to allow dual class share. Now, the other important point here I, I would like to uh, discuss is democracy. Corporate democracy is not citizen democracy. So citizen democracy is one person living for, for hopefully more than 85 years and voting on its future. Corporate democracy is made of voters who come in and out of a stock. Some of them come, out, come in for six months. Some of them come in when they smell blood, and, and if there's blood, then they stay. If there's no blood, they leave. Um, so these two models of democracy, they are not equivalent. Now, the last point I would like to touch is the question of abuse. And Michael, I never really considered myself as a benevolent dictator, but <laughs> you know what? Maybe it doesn't feel bad. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but this is an, an important point. Um, consider corporate history. There have been abuses by multiple shareholders, the, the most egregious of which, of which was the um, um, sorry, it's escaping my mind now, uh, that happened when they monetized their multiple voting shares at a very high price. That was Magna, Magna International. That was probably the worst example of a family-controlled company abusing the system. Now everyone has a coattail provision. We have a coattail provision. 
If we ever accept an offer that is 15% above market, all shareholders can avail themselves of the same offer. But there are also abuses in non-controlled companies. Think about Nortel, think about Valiant. These were, uh, Valiant was highly rated by the report on business of the Globe and Mail. Um, but look at what happened. They screwed up. They actually dishonestly hid key information. Whereas the study has shown that family companies make a point of disclosing more than other companies because they realize they enjoy a multiple voting share privilege. So these would be my opening comments, uh, Madam Chair. Interesting, interesting. All, all, all of you, interesting viewpoints. Uh, one of the uh, concerns that the Council uh, has, the Council of Institutional Investors has, is in the event of a takeover which threatens the control uh, of both management and ownership. Um, now, John, you had a couple of, you had one uh, incident involving China, which is interesting. Mm. Michael, you had an interesting situation with shareholder activism, and you had a takeover attempt by TELUS, where they offered a lot of money for... Rogers. Yeah. By Ro Rogers. Was it Rogers? Okay. Rogers so, John, do you want to start with what you did? I think this is interesting, what you have to do when you don't have control yeah. as, as a management and a, well, owner. So, I, you mentioned one. I, have, I can give examples of four different instances where shareholder power counted. So one was in the early 90s, we had a proxy fight where there was another group within the, 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 the group that decided to go rogue and decided that they wanted to change the board to have all of their acolytes on the board. There was a proxy fight. There was a vote wide open, and the vote turned down their proposal. They resigned, and our board uh, succeeded. And that would not have happened had we not had full voting, because they'd accumulated an almost controlling block. The second uh, situation was, at one time, when we did a very big acquisition, we had to have a partner to do that for us. A very large foreign construction company had 48% of our company decided they liked it so much, they wanted to buy the whole thing, but they want to buy it cheap. And they went around and tried. They tried twice, they tried one publicly, they once pr privately. And in each case, at the end of the day, because they were not allowed to vote, the other shareholders all overwhelmingly rejected their offer twice. Third, op third opportunity for complications was a major activist attack which thought they should try to change the board. And again, the shareholders were there to block. And then the one you referred to, the Chinese offer, uh, which was now five or six years ago, was a very high offer, very generous, voted on by our shareholders, 98% in favor. That was the power of the shareholder saying, this is value for us, better value than you, John, can do generating your own... Uh, continuing activity and was recommended and approved by the board and the government decided to step in and, and block that, which we respect. Uh, and in hindsight, probably was a good thing. So four different instances where the power of the shareholders, all the shareholders kept the thing on the, kept the business, in my view, on the straight and narrow. Michael? Yeah, I want to, I, I do want to reiterate that I am a, an enormous advocate in uh, the long-term multi-stakeholder benefit of a controlled enterprise. I'm enormously advocating that, notwithstanding my debates with the other. The, activ the, the activist shareholder, uh, kind of the takeover risk that you describe, um, is uh, enormously challenging in our environment because uh, we own four, my family owns 40% of the shares. So uh, to uh, take control of the enterprise, uh, they have to get some 85, 90% of the remaining vote. And even if they get 85% of the remaining vote, uh, we don't have to sell our shares and we have no fiduciary duty to other shareholders. We can say, well, that's fine. Buy all you want. We're holding on to ours, which says to any other strategic player 
they can't consolidate or access synergies. And it says to any PE firm, they can't pile on debt. So it, it really makes it an almost insurmountable object uh, when it comes to the takeover calculus. Having said that, we had one individual give it a try um, in 2010 for reasons that I understand at the time. There were some unique nuances. Um, and he did the classic you know, there's a there's a playbook for activism that is, uh, you know, I think there's a course somewhere in a in an MBA program that's called the activist playbook, and <laughs> and they play they run that playbook, you know, universally and consistently, and he ran all of that. Um, you know, the first twelve months, we you know we fought like cats and dogs at the board level. Ultimately, interestingly, we sat down in a room one time and we said, you know. We actually believe in 95% of the same things. We disagree on five. We agree on 95. Why don't we concentrate on talking about the 95, collaborate on the 95, and just ignore the five? And we did, and actually we became, he became a great partner. He became uh, a good friend. I still communicated with him regularly as a friend. He did very well with the investment, incredibly well. And I think he would, and he, he was completely additive to the business, but he was additive, not as a takeover artist, but as a collaborator, a very big brain who wanted 95% of the same thing. So it actually worked out pretty well. I, you know, um, as I left the CEO's chair a year ago, I called him and I said, you know, I want you to know that you added tremendous value to this business in the experience that we had, even though it was rocky in the first 12 months. Um, so... You know, I do think that that's, uh, you know, in a controlled enterprise, short-termism, you know, the average fortune, to, to Louis' point, the average fortune 500, according to The Economist, the average fortune 500 institutional shareholder holds the stock for 278 days. 278 days. You know, the, uh, the vast majority of my other 60% shareholders that I call on regularly the vast majority of them are paid on one-year alpha. That's what they're paid on. They don't give a shit about the, about the long-term health of the business or the long-term performance of the business. It's just not what they do, right? They're interested in the trading value in the next 12 to 24 months, and that's fine. I recognize that. I'm okay with that. I treat them respectfully. I try and align with shareholders that do have a longer-term perspective so that they're happy. I don't want dissatisfied shareholders. I want happy shareholders, but they have to be, you know, they have to understand what they're getting when they come in. They're getting a long-term view. They're not getting, they're not getting a quarter to quarter junkie. And, uh, you know, it's working, it's working pretty well. We have, you know, shareholder value ebbs and flows. We, if we do a large, if we do a large organic capital investment, we just finished one over a billion dollars here recently and putting new plants on the ground. It by definition means that our stock's going to be flat for four or five years because the, the capital markets will not value organic large-scale large scale investments like that. And I say, too bad, so sad. We're, it's going to be great when it's done. And they recognize that. So, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's threading a needle. I believe in a long-term enterprise. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily believe in benevolent dictatorships. Not that many of them aren't great. Yours is great. No, it's great. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm super proud to know you as if I was going to be a part of a benevolent dictatorship, I'd want to be part of yours. But, oh, wonderful. But, but I just I, I struggle with the concept because they're not all great, and the it's and okay. the prospect of abuse. Understood. That's right, think, Louis. Uh, if, what, okay, yeah, John. If I could add, I'm a benevolent dictator too, and I don't own a whole bunch of shares. No, you. I know you and your present. You you do it by the power of of your history and your competence and yeah. your leadership. It's yeah. the moral authority of leadership. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. so slightly different. I two other points. The first one is the fact that that fellow came along and did very well in the shares meant that the power of the shareholder worked. Yeah. In that case, that's what I've been talking about, all shareholders. And the second point is, you know, we have institutional shareholders that have been with us for many, many years. I'm not going to say decades, but many, many years. So not everybody is in the 278 no. days, but no. I, I respect the statistic. Louis, your horror stories. <laughs> yes, well, uh, well, you know my horror story because it was very public. Uh, but what I would like to say, if I may, is John, I admire 
you're keeping control through moral leadership. I, I think that is exemplary. The truth of the matter is most of, most of us can't do that. So I can't do that. The 70, uh, the 69 companies of the sample of 90 that are multiple voting shares controlled probably couldn't do that either. So, so, so I admire that. Now, what you've said, Michael, I would agree with virtually everything you said. And the reason is that you get a hostile takeover, you look at the other guy, you say, I have 40%, I have a blocking minority, want to buy it, go ahead. We, with multiple voting shares, are doing exactly the same thing. We're saying, you know, we control 70% of the votes. You want to go ahead? Do it. So I think there are a lot of similarities here uh, that strike me in listening to you. But how can 30% worry you? I'm sorry? You said 70%, you control 70 yes, directly or indirectly. Yes, yes. And you say, come on, to the 30%. There's no come on. They there can't. isn't. Exactly. Well, same, thing, <laughs> same, thing with him, same thing with him. No, he has 60%. Oh, no, he's, no, he's got 40. 60 he has 60% could get, of shareholders who he could have. He could take the 60, but no. If they wanted to gang up. Yeah. He could be ganged up on. That's just the point. Yeah. Um, there, so, but there have been, uh, yeah, so there have been uh, abuses, too, in terms of compensation, uh, governance practices. Uh, you, you alluded to some, some company, Valiant. That's fraud. That's illegal. Uh, so, you know, that, that can happen in any kind of structure. But I wondered if you, if you saw uh, the importance of coattails. Let's talk about coattails, because I think that's important, because investors don't have a lot of choice. There are a lot of dual voting shares out there, and you want to make sure that you have picked one of the right ones that's ethical. So explain what coattail provisions are, and I think that's important. Yes. And if you guys could respond. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so essentially, when we went public, it, we established that we wanted multiple voting shares, and the lawyers and uh, brokers said, okay, fine, but you will t undertake as a side commitment that should you accept an offer that is 15% higher than the going market price at the time of an offer, all shareholders will become eligible to that same offer. So what that does is that you, in fact, cannot sell if ever you do, which, which you all know we don't want to do, but if ever you do, you cannot sell at higher than more than 15% of the going mar market price at the time of the offer. That, does that answer it? Is that, do yeah, it? that, Is that, that a good that, answer? Yes, that begs a number of problems to me. Do you want to comment on that? It, I mean, it impedes a takeover. Premium. Well, I, don't, I, have, I, have the, I have a governance agreement at Maple Leaf Foods. I have a governance agreement with the board. Um, and in lieu of them having a poison pill or adopting a poison pill in the board, uh, I have agreed and willingly. I, I, like I'm, I am, have zero interest in doing anything but what's you know, just and morally correct for the other shareholders. Uh, and in pursuit of that, we uh, we uh, we agreed to a coattail provision. We have a coattail provision in our governance agreement. So, if my forty percent block goes to sell to anybody else, it's only on the basis that you know it's an offer to all. And if equally. you get if 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 all the if if you get an offer for fifteen or twenty percent premium for all the shareholders, you will not you you, you will uh, obviously the sixty percent will vote. You could be outvoted. Yeah, well... There's no impediment. No, 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 no. I can do whatever I want with my shares. What I'm saying, what the coattail provision is, is if I choose to do something with my shares, okay. then then the same offer has to be made to the other ones. Okay, that's the coattail. You know what I mean? That's, that's the very important. That's okay. Yeah, so, it, it, so that I can't say, well, I'm going to take a, you know, a a de facto controlled enterprise and deliver it to somebody else at a premium and all the other shareholders get, you know, toasted. That we can't do that. I mean, that's not fair. Okay. So if we go and we say we've got a 50% premium for the family's block, uh, then that same 50% premium needs to be offered to all the shareholders. And I, like, there's, there's just rules of fair play. There's just rules of fair play, and that's just rule of fair play. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have an even better rule of fair play. Wide open for all shareholders, <laughs> no coattails. <laughs> Well, I could do the same thing, but because of the de facto control of 40%. Right. 
Right. You know, and in that situation, John, the board, and I think I've got a board that believes in fair play and believes in good governance, and their they their defensive position is a poison pill. Yep. And they say, well, like if you're not going to be fair, then we're not going to be fair. Mm -hmm. And I, that's just. There's nothing wrong with that position. Yeah, so okay, um, you in your opening remark to this particular exchange, you you referred to issues about compensation. You were, I accountability. Think accountability. So the, the key here is the quality of the board. You have ex to have you extremely careful about recruiting people that have the same values as you, who who believe, as was said, in fairness, but are also very competent. And they ensure, and the Human Resource Committee of these people ensure that there are no abuses of any kind by a controlling shareholder, whether it's through salaries or benefits or side deals or anything like that. So that, that's very important. And, and I know of many executives who actually take lower pay. Think of a Pierre Calpinado at, at, uh, at Videotron. His pay is below what he would be uh, entitled to take Prem Watsa of Fairfax Holdings. He's being paid a pittance compared to what he's doing. So I think there are many cases of families who are reasonable about what they're doing. There are counterexamples. I won't name them this morning because that wouldn't be constructive. I'm just going to make a comment for a second, which is interesting, I think. I'm going to take the side of these two guys against my side on one point. Oh, gosh. And that is the board and its behavior when you're a widely held company, as opposed to boards that are probably more carefully selected as being value to their companies. Because we're widely distributed, because we need to have all of these different aspects represented on our board, I find that sometimes independent directors think more about their own reputations than they do about the benefit yes. of the their cont contribution to the board. And um, I think that's a weakness, um, and that is something that needs to be stiffened up. I think the whole ESG thing sometimes is taken just a little too seriously by every member of my board, and not enough about how do we make money. And so I think that there's that balance that still needs to be found, and I think you who would have a benefit of that. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more, John. And, uh, 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 you know, and I think, Louis, you're, you know, and I do admire what you've done as a family and what you do and what you represent and what you believe in. I think it depends on the benevolence of the benevolent. And, uh, uh, and you certainly demonstrate that some don't. As you point out, yeah. having said that, the, you know, the role of the directors are, is, you know, paramount. Uh, we went through this year, actually, we had a just timing worked out such that we had three directors that I had to recruit. And along with the governance committee, we had a group of the governance committee and family members that were involved in that recruiting process. And, you know, every one of the people we, we I interviewed many dozens of people and they all said one question. What do you, Michael, want out of a director? What do you want from us? And I said, I, I want to be really clear about this. I want three things from you. The first thing is I want you to be obsessed by your fiduciary duty, obsessed when, and I use that word carefully because the fiduciary duty in Canada, not so in the United States, but the fiduciary duty of a director in Canada is to the best long-term interest of the company and all its stakeholders, including the environment. That's our duty. That's the law. Too many people don't really get that in Canada. Yeah. I want you to be obsessed by that. Uh, it's about the company, not the family not the other shareholders, not the employees, the company. Number two is I want you to do the work to be able to understand our company. Because you can't act in the best interest of our company without doing the work to understand our business. It's not about the businesses you come to the table with. It's our business. So do the work. And number three is I, I really need you to do number one in the face of extraordinary pressure by the capital markets not to do number one. Right? Interesting. The capital markets pushes people, directors, not to act in the best interest of the company, to act in the best interest of their shareholdings now. 
And it's an ex- to your point about reputation, it's extraordinary. The directors are not representatives of the shareholders. They're appointed by the shareholders. They are act in the best long-term interest of the company and all its stakeholders. Yeah, interesting comment. I interviewed uh, Hartley Richardson. Richardson family is probably the the record holder of family-controlled enterprise in Canada, five generations. Nice. They usually bomb out after three, um, but five generations. And they're in finance, they're in agriculture, renewables, energy, tremendous uh, uh, company uh, enterprises, some public, some not. And I remember saying to Hartley, how have you kept it together in the family for so long and still outperform and are best in class in everything you're involved in? And he said, we have one rule in our family, is no member of the family, at this point after five generations, it's probably 400 people that are getting coupons from Richardson Enterprises, okay, four generations, cousins and so on. No person who's a member of the Richardson family can have a line position because we have to be able to fire anybody and that keeps it honest and that keeps us with integrity and there's no question about corruption and nepotism yeah you want to comment on that I thought that was brilliant it, 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 well I, I not easy okay yeah I had the, the I was invited to speak at the Richardson family conference with all of those generations from young to very old uh, about six months ago. Hundreds, right? And hundreds of them in the room. And it was enlightening, inspiring, and entertaining all all, all at the same time. And uh, they've they've clearly done it right. Uh, They've done it right. You know, there's lots of different philosophies. You know, being, being involved in family businesses for so long, there's lots of different models attached to that. I, um, uh, one of the one of the greatest leaders in the food industry, Anthony Longo, 26, 28 stores in, in Ontario, and he had 14 family members in the business. And I said, Anthony, how the hell do you manage that? Like, it, it was just that's, astonishing. That's but honestly, it's their family culture. They're able to manage it. I have other, biz- I have other families who their rule is you're not allowed a management job in the business. So okay. it, it, I don't think there's a black and white, Diane. No. I think it goes, I think it depends on the culture of the family and how they make that work. Um, and there's lots of different models. Yeah. Yep. May I uh, intervene? So it's a delicate question because if you want the next generation to understand what's going on, being an observer on the board is not enough. Uh, and I personally have lived, you, you have to start at the bottom and go up. So if your rule is, well, you, you can't have any family member as as an executive, then it's very hard for them to learn. Uh, other companies I've seen, their rule is there, there will be no more than three family companies in line, com- in line positions in this company. Other companies will say, uh, well, you have to have a master's degree and you have to master three languages. And it's, that sort of conditions the pool of who is able to aspire to the best job. Uh, and sometimes they never reach the best job. And, it, and, it's, and that's okay, as long as the family maintains the philosophy with regard to excellent performance over the long term, care of the environment, care of the communities in which we operate. John, you, you've, you've been a consolidator, so you've taken over a lot of family businesses yeah. along the way and inherited a culture that was may, maybe f- riddled with nepotism. How have you dealt with that? That's right. So what we tr- try to do as best we can is to preserve whatever culture exists in the organization that's made it successful. We certainly don't want to reinvent them. We don't want to say, here's the new rule book. Uh, we want to nurture that mentality, and we've been able to do that uh, Successfully, I would just want to add one thing to these this, this discussion about boards and, and CEOs and so on. I have a rule on my board. Every board member has to have been a CEO because they're the only ones who really understand what it's like to be CEO and therefore can be the best judge of the performance of the, or not, of, of, the, of the CEO. Not easy to achieve. 
to okay. have an all CEO board is a very difficult objective. To and achieve. everybody has limits on how many boards they can have too. Yeah. That's another yeah, thing, also, which I think is a good rule. Yeah, Michael, it is. It is Michael, you wanted to say yeah. something? Nope. <laughs> wow. A maritimer who's quiet suddenly. Did we offend you? No, no, no. no I'm just I, was just, I was absorbing I'm John's just... comment, saying, geez, I admire that. I'm, I'd like to I'd like to achieve that. So I'm absor go. absorbing that. The only the only downside I think would find ex, they, yeah. they could be ex CEOs, right? No, I, I think one of the things you have to be right. careful of, of that, and I agree with that. I love that perspective. You have to be careful about the ability to get diversity of thought. Yeah. At the same time. That's the watch out, I think. That's yeah. true. That's they important. all think too much about making money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> last, last thoughts? Louis, you start. John? Uh, well, last thoughts. I, 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 not really, but I think this, this discussion has been fascinating because I think that these three panelists are closer than maybe they thought when we entered the stage, if I may express my personal opinion. I agree you are the purest of the three. Um, and Michael, uh, yeah, we're, pretty, we're pretty close. <laughs> my, my view is these are all variations on the theme. At the end of the day, we all want the best for the shareholder. There's no question. And I think it's just a matter of what works in each particular circumstance and adapting to that circumstance. Michael, last word. Well, I, uh, the, where I'd leave it with is uh, we have in our enterprise a deep commitment to multi-stakeholderism, which is we want the best thing for all of the stakeholders in the enterprise, including the shareholders. But we have, I, I'm one of the few CEOs in Canada who's given at every annual meeting, told the shareholders that we reject the primacy of shareholders. We reject the primacy of shareholders against the other share, uh, against the other stakeholders, and uh, I think that's an ever important prism uh, in capitalism that we should develop. Great, thank you, thank you.